one of the most important faith uh, moments in our faith development comes when we learn to trust God with our frustrations toward him. Now, for some of us, this may sound odd. God is perfect. He doesn't do anything wrong. His ways are higher than our ways. And scripture entrusts us, instructs us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and to lean not on our own understanding. Now, this sounds like sound advice, but if we fail to look at the whole of Scripture, we might miss the invitation to wrestle through our disappointment and disillusionment in this life, even when that disillusionment is directed toward God himself. If we're not careful, we can even use the Bible as this tool for, to, to silence our lament. Now, let me be clear. The truth of God's word is, is a necessary to anchor and to hold on to as our, our, as, as our feelings seek to spiral us into these dark places. It helps interrupt our thoughts as we feel and our circumstances begin to warp how we think. I want you to kind of picture a hiker that's sliding down an embankment and, and to stop their descent, they swing an ax and hit the rock to anchor them. And we can do the equivalent when we cling to the truth during an emotional spiral in our lives. This is helpful for our growth. This is helpful for our faith development. In fact, it's an act of faith. Using the scriptures to suppress our wrestling or our lament is a less helpful practice. It can be frustrating when we, when we deal with someone who is always right. Have you ever met that guy who just always seems to be right? Almost annoying. And when we encounter someone more intelligent, wiser, or more seasoned than us, oftentimes we'll stop questioning, make assumptions, and we'll distance ourselves from them. But the problem with this strategy is that when we do, we fail to become more like them. Now this, if this is true in a human relationship, how much more so in our relationship with God? When we pray, some of us interrupt our dialogue by filling in the blanks with what we believe that God will say. I had a dear friend who used, who used to do this, and I would, be, I would be asked a question followed by an immediate verbalized assumption of what they thought that I was going to say. And so I was present, I was there, but I didn't feel like I was a part of the conversation. And the same pattern can persist in our prayer lives if we're not careful. God, I'm, I'm struggling with your goodness today, but I know I shouldn't because your word says that you are good. I, I've had difficulty with my circumstances, but I know that all things work together for the good, so I suppose that I'll endure. And, and see, when we talk over God, even with our own word, even with his own words, we, we tend to minimize our pain. Additionally, we fail to listen and hear, which, which prohibits him from revealing more of himself to us. And this pattern can become a breeding ground for resentment if we're not careful. We feel like we know the truth about God, but we don't know him because our conversations are one-sided and they fail to address our frustrations. When we read the scriptures, we find that God is not afraid of our misinformed, irrational accusations against his character and his goodness. The Psalms invite us to question, to wrestle, and to bring our indictments before the Lord. And there we find that he is more than capable of handling our complaints. He is not offended by our engagement, and the most famous psalmist in all of Scripture was considered a man after God's own heart. And so there is a direct correlation between our willingness to wrestle through our doubts and frustrations and our intimacy with the Lord. 
We are working through the final chapter of the book of Jonah, and it seems like a text that, quite frankly, shouldn't exist. It seems like a text that uh, we, we have this prophet fought, who followed through with his call. He orchestrated one of the most effective revivals in human history and saved over 120,000 people from destruction and the wrath of God. If anything, this text might conclude with the, and the prophet returned to Israel, full of joy and gladness at the great mercy of the Lord. Well, this does not, however, summarize the final chapter in the book of Jonah. And so let's read our conclusion for this text. It says, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn your back from destroying people. Just, just kill me now. Lord, I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Well, then the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Well, then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. And the next morning at the dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, well, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? So Jonah became frustrated with God's change of plans. Now, it may be important to note that, that Jonah and God had brief interactions up to this point. Jonah talked to God. God spoke to Jonah, but, but nothing that would be considered this two-sided conversation. And this text represents their first back-and-forth discussion, at least that which was recorded. And in their interaction, we find that Jonah knew God's character, but he didn't admire it. Instead, he lamented it, and he despised it. Until now, we could only hypothesize Jonah's motives in going to Tarshish, and in chapter 4, the prophet verbalizes his hesitations. Didn't I say that before I left home that you would do this? Isn't it just like you? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. Now, imagine a husband hearing some sort of a similar statement. Isn't it just like you to listen to me attentively, constantly buy me flowers and clean the house and leave the toilet seat down? <laughs> See, Jonah didn't mind God's mercy, his compassion and his unfailing love when it was directed toward the Israelites. But the thought of God extending the same compassion to Israel's enemy who, who just happened to have committed countless atrocities against his fellow compatriots was too much. He lamented God's hairpin trigger when it came to his mercy. He was slow to get angry, quick to forgive, and generous in offering mercy at the first sign of remorse and repentance. Repentance. 
We then find the extent of the prophet's anger. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Now, the source of Jonah's identity and his life was under attack. And when it was taken away, he saw no need to continue living. Ironically, he wasn't willing again to do the deed himself. He made the sailors throw him into the sea earlier. Now he's just asking God to take his life. And he continues with this disordered life filled with a mix of self-righteousness, patriotism, God's law, each informing his decisions. And his statement communicates to God that that he has lost something in his life that, that gave his life ultimate meaning and purpose. He is telling the source of life that you're not enough. He had a relationship with God, but it failed to meet his deepest needs. And the prophet tasked with preaching repentance from idolatry had somehow formed one of his own. Now, patriotism is an evil, is not evil. The love of country is a God-given desire. In fact, the nations will someday be restored. But like any other love, it can be elevated above our love for God. Have you ever seen that happen? There are those throughout our country who will enter into a spiritual funk the moment the election results are verified, regardless of who wins here in a couple months. Ironically, Jonah's fears were legitimate. The same people repenting today would eventually turn from their return to their evil ways. They would conquer Israel and destroy their capital, Samaria. And unlike the Judean tribes, they would be exiled and never return to the promised land. They assimilated into the Assyrian culture. They lost much of their cultural identity. Destroying Nineveh may have provided, at least in theory, the Israelites with decades of political peace in their region. Jonah's work in Nineveh may have pleased the Lord, but it threatened Israel's security. It appears that if the prophet were forced to choose between God's interest and national security, he would have desired the latter. He would rather die a patriot than live as God's servant. And God responds with a simple question. Is it right for you to be angry about this? Apparently, Jonah had no desire to answer this question. Instead, Jonah set up camp east of Nineveh. In Scripture, not much good happens when traveling east. Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden east of Eden. After the flood, migrants moved east and built the Tower of Babel. When separating from his Uh, his uncle Abraham, Lot chose the east and settled near Sodom and Gomorrah. Now we have the prophet journeying east of the city Nineveh. And while there, he set up this temporary shelter. And the desert heat in that region could climb above 120 degrees. If you add wind, obviously it becomes like a convection oven, making conditions miserable. So he planted himself, presumably for the next 40 days, to see what would happen to the Assyrians. And maybe God would again change his mind. Maybe God would have time to think about what had occurred and the atrocity that had, that had happened and bring his wrath against Israeli enemies. And while he was there, a tremendous blessing happened. A plant A beautiful, broad shade shade leaves grew up and provided relief from the hot sun. Scripture says that God appointed and arranged for this plant. This was given by God to be a blessing. This is the same word when God appointed or arranged for a fish to swallow the prophet. These are the tools for God's deliverance. Unfortunately for the prophet... God had two more arrangements the next day. But God also arranged for a worm 
The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. Does God give only to take away? How is this different from a neighbor offering a glass of cold iced tea on a hot summer day only to then purposefully knock it over and spill it after a few sips? Is this the same sentiment shared by those who have lost children or spouses prematurely? Does God tease us with good gifts only to take them away? If we fail to press through these questions, we will be left with disordered lives. When we live disordered lives, our anger becomes disproportionate when the source of our real life is threatened. One of, God, one of the Lord's appointments took away something good, and the scorching wind added something bad. And this may spark a few questions. Does God allow bad things to affect his people? And if that's true, is this good? God does not cause bad things, but he allows us to be touched by the power of sin and death that we brought into the world as humanity to produce something of worth in us. I appreciate how J.I. Packer approaches this topic in his book, Knowing God. And there he states, still... He blesses those on whom he sets his love in a way that humbles them so that all the glory may be his alone. Still, he hates sins. He hates the sins of his people. And he uses all kinds of inward and outward pains and griefs to wean their hearts from compromise and disobedience. Still, he seeks the fellowship of his people and sends them both sorrows and joys in order to detach their love from other things and attach it to himself. No one likes a storm, enjoys suffering or the loss of comfort, or an oppressive heat that wipes and saps us of our strength. To allow us to remain stubborn is, is obviously, is, I'm sorry, to allow us to remain stubborn or oblivious to our idolatry, that isn't love. A gentle reminder and a question to ponder didn't work. It was going to take the death of his beloved plant and a harsh wind to get him to re-engage with God. Jonah then reaffirms his desire to die. Now, I want you to note the irony. The prophet who helped his enemies avoid God's wrath is now experiencing a taste of God's judgment. They rejoiced that he, they rejoiced that they avoided suffering as the prophet endured a scorching wind appointed by God. And he was done. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Now note the steadfast patience of God. Let me be clear. God is a far better parent than your pastor is. At this point, I'm using words like entitled brat, selfish, stubborn. I might even turn up the heat a little bit. You think that's hot? I'll show you hot. But God instead asks a simple question. Is it right for you to be angry because, of the, plant, because the plant died? We see God baiting the prophet to wrestling through his own sin. And Jonah is exhausted. He's hot. He's angry in his response. Yes, Jonah retorted, angry enough to die. I guess, it's, it's just me hypothesizing. I kind of guess that Jonah was a dignified man for most of his life. That he moved from village to village, garnering the people's respect as the prophet who spoke on behalf of Israel's prosperity. He may have walked in a dignified manner, dressed as one set apart from the common folk. And now he finds himself under a makeshift shelter shelter 
irrationally mourning over a plant and cursing his circumstances like he lost a family member, kind of like a crazy person. So how would God respond? Well, God sends, God ends the book with a penetrating question. He points out the prophet's disordered priorities. Let me read again. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? God performs performs soul surgery on the prophet, exposing his hypocrisy and his disordered love. He starts with the plant. Jonah was grieved over a plant. He didn't make the plant. He didn't even plant the seed that caused it to grow. This plant had no personality. It could not communicate with Jonah. It wasn't made in the image of God. It didn't live a long life. It was a mercy given to Jonah by God to alleviate his suffering. On the other hand, Nineveh was filled with people who were made in the image of God. The NLT describes them as living in spiritual darkness. The more literally, it states that they didn't know their left hand from their right. And the idea was that they didn't have a clue when it came to spiritual directives. They didn't have Israel's covenant, their law, or their prophets up until Jonah. If Jonah so ruthlessly dedicated his life to a day-old plant, how much more should God extend his mercy to the Ninevites? Not to mention the cattle. God is just, and we can celebrate his justice. But we we should also do so with an understanding of his love. If we revel in the idea of our enemies being humiliated or destroyed, we are missing the heart and the character of God. The end of the book might make you look through your Bible and like turn the page and go, uh... Where's the rest of the story? How did Jonah react? Did he stay there for for the full 40 days or did he return to Israel? Did he allow the question to change his perspective or did he die an old embittered prophet? How was Jonah to be received when he returned to Israel? These questions are not anywhere answered in the text. (coughs) There's a reason the book masterfully ends this way. We've mentioned in this series that the book of Jonah is best read as a mirror and not a window. The book's ending reminds us that we are all Jonah. We must deal with our self-righteousness, stubborn idolatry, and our hatred of our enemies. We're invited to wrestle through comforts that may take priority over people. The book confronts our bigotry and our us versus them tendencies in all of our lives. We're reminded that God loves cities. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but but many churches tend to abandon urban areas, leaving them to their fate. We lament how dangerous they've become and we devalue those who choose to stay there. We live in a place where there are more plants than people. God reminds Jonah that he values people over plants. And so do we share in God's priorities? It's a natural human tendency to detach ourselves from other people and their problems. We may use counseling terminology to justify our behavior. And again, I want to be careful here because we we want to say things like, well, these people aren't safe. And again, I want to be clear. There are people who are not safe. They're abusers. They're manipulative. They're evil. But some under the guise of mental health, will distance themselves from hard people because we don't want their unhappiness to become our own. But this is not true of God. And Tim Keller states it simply, real compassion, the voluntary attachment of our heart to others means the sadness of their condition makes us sad. It affects us. 
This is deeply uncomfortable, but it's the character of compassion. In Scripture, we see the contrast between Jesus and Jonah. Jonah fled the city, but Jesus entered into it. Jonah wished for its destruction, but Jesus wept over Jerusalem's impending judgment. Jonah was inflamed with wrath, while Jesus was filled with pity. On the cross, Jesus prayed that they would be forgiven, and in the desert, Jonah demanded God's judgment. Jesus entered into our sorrow, took it upon himself, and exchanged it for his righteousness and joy. Before we transition into application, this, the text may offer a few subtle hints at Jonah's response to God's questioning. Now, again, we don't know the time frame. It may have taken months, weeks, or even, even years for God's heart to penetrate the prophet's mindset to the point that it altered how he thought about his enemies. And again, maybe it never happened. We don't, we don't know. But the one evidence that we are left pointing to Jonah's repentance is the fact that this book exists to begin with. Scholars have questioned Jonah's historicity for years, and they struggle with the idea of a man living in a fish for three days and, and Nineveh's unlikely and nearly comical repentance. Proponents of Jonah's historicity point to Jesus' acknowledgement of Jonah's story and the nature of the book's portrayal of the prophet. Jonah, throughout the book, is made to look like a bigoted, irrational fool. He is selfish, he's hateful, he's idolatrous, and yet we only know this story because he was willing to tell it. Jonah alone was in the belly of the fish. He was the lone prophet delivering God's message and was by himself under the vine in the heat. Who records the story of their most significant failure in life without bothering to even reflect on the happy ending. Not a self-righteous man. The answer is a man who finally understands the grace of God extended towards him. We see the same dynamic in the Gospels. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one doesn't typically make a, up a world religion by pointing out the founding fathers Flaws, mistakes, denials, and mental dullness. Jonah can recollect his failure because he has become secure in God's acceptance and love. And what was true of God had finally become true of him. So let's transition into how we should apply this text today. And the first is we must be attentive to our tendency to drift back into old mindsets. One would think an elongated time in the belly of a fish would have given the prophet ample time to examine his self-righteousness, his lack of love, and hypocrisy. A song of praise in chapter 2 quickly became a bitter lament in chapter 4. And Jonah's life reminds us that we must, repeated, we must repeatedly learn the same truth. There is no arrival when it comes to the depth of wisdom found in God's commands. A common conservative stumbling block is failing to discern the difference between being able to recite a truth and having that same truth be true of us. One will make us sound holy in our speech the other reminds us that to be holy, truth must refresh our souls and penetrate our thoughts, and this is a lifelong process. Jonah knew and proclaimed to the people of Israel that God was merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. And yet in this text, he resented these characteristics instead of cherished them. The story revealed that the truth about God had yet to transform the prophet's heart. Part of the battle in admitting that we will always have a divided heart, well, part of the, I'm sorry, part of the battle is admitting that we will always have a divided heart while we walk this earth carrying around this old crucified flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, 
The condemning power of sin was destroyed. It lost its power to cast us into Sheol or hell. It still has the power, has actual power in our lives. Scripture still refers to it as a force. In the book of Galatians, Paul refers to these two forces, the spirit and the flesh, fighting against one another. This means that we can't stand still in our theology, beliefs, and behaviors, or we will not grow as we're intended to grow. We must mine for God's truth and righteousness. A surface-level understanding of truth is not enough. The more I read Scripture, the more I see the discrepancy between who God says I should be and do and believe and what I actually do and believe. Listen, I know I'm supposed to be gentle, but I still fall short of the gentleness of Christ. I'm to love my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I don't love any of you as deeply as I should. If I fail to see my growth as a process, I am primed for a Jonah moment. I've had a few in my life. I remember one time when I used to pride myself on being a loving person. I used to pride myself on being a loving person until God introduced me to a woman that I was tempted to hate and who really, really hated me. I claimed to trust God's plan for my life until I was told to do something I never dreamt I was I would ever do. When we grow content and fail to allow God's righteousness to work in, out in us gradually over time, God will send events that clearly show us the discrepancy between God's character and ours. We are not beyond returning to our old mindsets and behaviors. The daily renewal of our minds by the gospel will help us in a, help, help put us in a place where God can continue to make his character our own. And next, I think it's important that we be grateful for the worms. I, for one, am not naturally grateful for the worms. Oh, look, the IRS messed up my tax payment and now demands money plus penalties and interest. woo -hoo! What's that leak in the ceiling? I thought we fixed that. The car's in the shop, dear. Again, I'm a fan of shaded vines. When the car runs smoothly, when there's more money than month, my body doesn't hurt, and my kids are walking with the Lord, those are all leafy vines that when they're happening, oh, I love it, I enjoy it. But over time, the human heart longs for comfort and shade from the pain and the suffering in this world. And this is a natural desire. It's a desire for something better, and that's, that's a good thing. But a problem occurs when what is intended to be a blessing supplants God as our source of life and our greatest joy. We may be dull to the subtle shift in our hearts. Our words may still proclaim Jesus is Lord and the source of our greatest joy, but our minds are focused elsewhere. The focus may be on good things. It may be on the love of family, the love of country, the love of work. When our lives are disordered, often the only way to expose them is a worm. We live in a fallen world where bad things happen. There's a constant shift between shade and harsh winds blowing in our faces. These trials grow and they develop and they help our faith. And when, when we find God attacking a tender spot or a disordered love, our response will often be irrational or explosive anger. Because the worm, oh, that feels so cruel in the moment. Why would God seemingly take something that we care so deeply about? It is always to give us something better. Why settle for the good stuff when we can have a relationship with and find our life in worshiping the giver? I want to close today with a hymn composed by John Newton in the late 1700s, the same guy that wrote Amazing Grace, and is quoted in a few books that I've read on this text, and he summarizes Jonah chapter 4 
And in it, he refers to a vine as a gourd. Some of you guys are old King James, or so you remember this. What is this vine talk? It was a gourd, right? But it says this. I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. Twas he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer, but it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hoped that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power subdue my sin and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more, with his own hand he seemed, intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed and blasted my gourds and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling, I trembling cried, Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest find thine all in me. The same process towards God's righteousness is, is settled. Uh, the process towards God's righteousness is settled, but its application isn't easy. It's painful, sometimes harsh, and may even cause us to doubt. But North, it's always worth it. Let God blast our gourds, I love that phrase, so we might find our rest and our joy in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and, and God for men that have walked this trail and women that have walked this trail long before we ever have. Those that have learned to grow, those that have learned to mature, God, those that have clung to your righteousness at salvation and continue to work out that righteousness until the end. Lord, it's not easy. And sometimes I just prefer the gourds. Oh, I prefer the leafy shade. But Lord, when that leafy shade takes too much of a place in my heart, God, you are gracious and you send the worm. Thank you, Lord, for the worm. Thank you, Lord, for the winds that draw my face back to a relationship with you. God, do this for your glory in all of our lives and in Jesus' name.